Hi everyone, it's great to have so many of you here. Uh, my name is Marek Pyhäjärvi, and well, even though I say my name, I don't expect any of you to be able to say it after me. I'm kind of used to going around the world and having people look at me a little bit weirdly on like, oh, please tell me how to say your name again, and again, and again, and again. I think this is now my talk number 390 something, so I've done a couple of talks over the years. So I have a bit of a empirical evidence on how things, things usually go. But you're being a bit of a special crowd for me in the sense that I do talk a lot about Agile, I do talk a lot about testing, but I don't often get to talk to people who are particularly into this, this product design, uh, product management space. And I was really delighted that I, I got a chance of, of uh, presenting on this particular topic here today. Uh, we're going to be talking from a little bit of, of a different perspective than all the talks that I have heard today. I've been listening to different samples all day long. And uh, there's a couple of differences. One of the differences is that I am not a product owner. I am not a designer. I am not leading a design team. I am not a uh, uh, leading product owner team. So I'm none of those, those roles. I'm actually, uh, I nowadays con consider myself a developer. I'm a developer and a tester, and I've been a tester for most of my career, 25 years so far. So uh, that has given me a chance of working with lots of lots of different people. But also uh, a big part of my identity is that I work in a single development team. So I'm not trying to improve the whole organization. I am trying to have a great time with a one single team. And I'm trying to provide great results with that team of, of developers, product owners, whatever roles we end up having there. I'm working at a company called F-Secure. And there's a couple of things about me and, and F-Secure that I should be mentioning before we, we dig into deep, deeper into this topic. One of them is that I used to be a lead quality engineer, as the title says. Last June, they decided uh, in my team that they would move me uh, into this uh, senior manager Windows endpoint development uh, role. So I have now 12 people who report to me. But I approach this management position as in uh, my goal is to get fired in a year. Like I want to go back to being just a tester, just a developer in those teams. So kind of emphasizing this, you know, liberty, self-management, uh, freedom, so living up to the values that we a lot of times talk about in the, in the Agile field. Another thing that is good to remember is that a lot of times uh, these sessions are about, you know, building something new. And I'm actually not doing that. I'm not building something new and, 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 and uh, kind of like creating a whole new flow. But what I'm doing actually is, is that I have a product that has existed for about 30 years now. 30 years, and it has seen many, many generations of different technologies, and, and it has changed. Like the most recent change has been in the last two years. We're kind of just finalizing a huge technology change in the, the product that we're building, so that uh, we're getting all the millions of our customers into the latest technology, so that whatever new cool stuff we end up building, they would even get it. So, so that's a very different setting uh, for doing many of the things. And also, kind of, it's good to remember that in the company that I work with, we do security software, endpoint protection, antivirus is the most uh, common use case that you would know of. And uh, we have some millions of customers, uh, each of them individually installing the thing that we're building on their own personal computers. And that, for example, means that when we look at the stuff that team builds and, and all the teams, different teams building into this system build, we have a system of test automation that actually spawns 14,000 uh, virtual machines just to test it inside the house on a daily basis. So the scale is kind of like, and sometimes it's a little bit fluffy and, and difficult to, to explain. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage to give you some of these, these ideas on, on what kind of things we're doing. So I come to this whole experience from the background of being a tester of 25 years, I have had the privilege of programming in only 16 languages so far. You know, that's what testers do. So in case you didn't know, that's completely possible and, and plausible thing for a tester to do. But one of the things that I really found important in all of the 25 years with this tester identity is that uh, I look at the stuff other people are building 
It might be the plans or the b backlogs that the product owners are building, or it might be the code that the developers are building. I look at it, and I kind of look at it as, as, as if like it might not be completely true. There might be something here that we don't yet know. It might be that there's bugs, you know, that's the simple part. But there might be features that we have never developed because nobody was asking for them. The customers might be asking for something, but they actually mean something completely different. And all these layers of, of kind of how people work together to solve the problems around software development, they've been the big fascination for me for pretty much all of my career. And this has transformed me into thinking of like, you know, I'm not just breaking illusions about the code. The code is actually the end result. Like if we don't get our plans and designs and whatever into code, the users won't be able to use them. Like they get to use prototypes, paper prototypes or running prototypes. But that's not the real thing. Like we have to have the code involved. But there's many kinds of things where we're breaking illusions overall. So I'm often talking around these illusions with this idea that, you know, there's things on like basic around product, but also there's these ideas leading to code. And specifically today, the, the sample of having no product owner is in the process area of these illusions. So as part of my work, uh, as anyone in my company could, I can just, you know, decide that uh, maybe we should do things differently. Maybe we should try something different. And I can propose that within my team, I can propose that within other teams, and, and whatever we end up uh, doing or, or selecting to do, that's what, what gets done. So here's a little bit of a list of things we are doing right now in my team. So we're uh, delivering continuously, meaning uh, that uh, we have versions available cont uh, all the time. But since we have one million and something installations to do every time we deliver, it's not one server or 10 servers, it's millions of individual computers we're installing every single time we deliver, it actually has a financial impact. Like it means that someone has to download quite a relevant size of a package and pay for the transfer cost. We have to pay for some of them, the customers have to pay for some of them. So doing that really, really, really continuously wouldn't be a nice mechanism. So we've built a, a way of, of throttling and, and delivering it, it uh, in a bit uh, slower pace. So usually a new version is available uh, once a week or every two weeks. So that's the pace that we found that customers are, are now okay with. We don't use Jira much, that's a whole uh, story of its own, but basically focusing on communication face-to-face -face or calling our offices in Poland. So I'm in Finland, some of our people are in Poland, some of our people are, are in South Africa nowadays, so again we have to do multi-site development, but we rather often try to meet people face-to-face, -face, whatever mechanism the face-to-face -face is, than uh, work with JIRA. And this is not true for any other teams in my whole organization. This is just my team that emphasizes this. We don't spend our time on estimating. There's a whole other talk here on no estimates. I suggest that you would go and talk to that. It has been a transformational practice in my team. So Budizuil, I think he is later in the day today. So if you get a chance of uh, having a chat with him, that would be a good thing. We have no product owner anymore. We actually don't have projects anymore. There's just continuous flow of features. And, and you know we discover something new. We figure out what we want to build. And then we try to build that and deliver it to the customers rather sooner than, than later. And also, we used to do a lot of Scrum. Basically, two-week increments come from that side. And now it's more like continuous flow Kanban style management, so no scrum either. So this is kind of the, the story. But all of this uh, kind of is, is related to the idea that we discovered or we found that within the development teams, over the years of trying to build software, the easiest way to get things wrong was to make sure that the developers didn't know why we were doing something or what we were trying to achieve with that. So if the developers were well versed in the idea of what we wanted, they often built on top of that idea and they made it better. And when we made them kind of look at an idea that somebody else formulated and, and try to just deliver that, they were not very joyous but also they made mistakes of kind of like, I didn't know that, nobody explained that to me, 
like they weren't actively thinking around uh, what they were building and the code, the product that ended up being delivered, wasn't always the best possible one. We also noticed this dynamic where a lot of times uh, when things went wrong, there was a big problem in production, for example. Who do you call in our organization? Well, the developer. I was the tester in the team. I never got woken up 2 a.m. in the morning. And none of my developers in the past would have kind of you know, lived through a life in the organization without a story of being woken up at some weird hour or being expected to do something at late hours, or you know, there's a concept of working 24-7 until the customer problem is solved. That never hit me. So what hit me as a, as a tester and a teammate who cares about the persons that I, that I work with is that I really don't want things to be so that uh, the developers don't have the means, but they have the, the, the responsibilities. So I started off with this, this whole discussion around no product owners. So for my organization, uh, I think we've done something we call Agile maybe 14, 15 years now. So it's been long enough. I haven't been all the time in the company. I'm now on my second term in the company. So I came back two and a half years ago and I was there earlier 12 years ago. But uh, we've been doing Agile uh, style development for a really long time and we had done many changes over the years. We had, for example, kicked out all of the Scrum Masters. They actually ended up being fired in the organization. So knowing that that was kind of like in the history or DNA, like now in the, of the organization, that even that kind of things could happen, I was a little uncomfortable with this idea of no product owner at first. Because I actually wasn't looking at, at getting them away, but I was looking at getting the responsibility at the developers or the team with the immediate uh, delivery responsibility. So the idea started formulating basically from uh, ideas uh, around discussions like this. Customer obsessed teams don't have product owners. And the idea with this particularly is that if you have someone who makes the choices for you, a product owner who builds a backlog and maintains the priorities, and then the developers are kind of actually just taking orders, then you don't actually have the full potential of the team in place, but you have people who kind of like just obey orders and whatever learning happened by the product owner don't get fully transferred. Because learning is kind of a personal thing where everyone has to take a, a responsibility. Also, I kind of formulated this idea out of all of these articles that I was reading that maybe if it is the most important thing that a product company is trying to do is to make money out of solving actual customers' problems so that they're willing to pay for that, maybe it doesn't make sense to specialize one person only into that problem. Maybe it's everyone's problem. Maybe we should all be thinking about this. So I started talking about this in my organization and the first reaction from the, the current position holder, the product owner, was, uh, oh no, 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 not a good idea. And we didn't have to actually talk very long until he was like, okay, sure, like, you know, we could, you know, experiment with this. We could try something different. Like maybe, you know, maybe we'll figure out that, that whatever I'm doing is, is really critical and, and necessary. But like, even if uh, we would find out that this is the, the, the perfect excuse for developers to actually start taking ownership, you know, that would also be a valuable learning that we can, we can take out of this. So all of this kind of came from this idea of, of modern Agile. So uh, we talked with the product owner and, and looked at kind of what they were doing as, as part of their work. And we realized that uh, they had days full of work. So when the team and the product owner had this discussion on, on taking over this, this product owner role, uh, we realized there's, there's so much to do. So if someone has full, full 40 hours every week and, and they're still overflowing with work, like throwing that into the development team, it must have some impact, right? So we had this discussion. I said, okay, like, you know, we are ready to, to take that risk and let's, you know, keep our eye on, on that and on how it, it ends up going. And we talked around all the different areas that product owners often do. This uh, uh, 
poster here is, is from a fellow uh, named William Jill. And I really love the, the material that he started publishing on the complete product owner. Even that already gives a great idea of all kinds of tool sets that a product owner is supposed to have. And just having this discussion of like, you know, all the different areas that we're supposed to be following on was a really valuable experience for the development team. Like, oh, all these kind of things might be happening in the background. What would that, that then, then mean? So there's all kinds of things around, well, product definition and vision, but also on just driving innovation and, and making things better. So kind of safely talking around the product owner's role, what kind of things filled their days, it gave us this, this place where we were felt a little bit more safe to get into the, the idea of, of let's first experiment with this. You know, we don't have to commit to anything. And we talked about the time frame. We, we decided the three months sounds like a good time frame to get some results, but it's not too long. Too long so that, you know, if we want to kind of revert back, we are not yet completely anywhere else. So we set up this, this three-month experiment, experiment. First one thing we did is kind of formulated the, the idea of what were we trying to do. So what was the, the idea that we were trying to either prove or disprove? And since I am a tester, I want to disprove every hypothesis. I am actively looking for evidence that things are not true, because that's the only way to, you know, even getting closer to really proving or understanding anything. Looking at the positive signs is not enough. You have to look for evidence against whatever you're trying to, to achieve. So we believe that, you know, if every one of the team members, every single developer, every single tester in that 12-person team would actually feel ownership towards the client, would have direct connections with the clients, well, some of the millions at least, uh, then uh, we would probably, we thought that we would probably actually be performing better. And, and this whole concept of what does it mean to perform better, we looked at, at six months before, what had we delivered, what kind of things had been happening, and kind of created a baseline, baseline out of that. And we also looked at the things we have done before. So we realized we didn't have a manager, so we already kind of like had given up on, on that idea that we needed a manager who would somehow manage all the team's work. Uh, we had already figured out that uh, we can talk to each other, like we can uh, share the work without Jira. Jira, and it's still a headache for some of the, the uh, more processy oriented people in our, our organization. And one of the things particularly relevant for this experiment was that we used to have the product owner that we were now removing from the position, we used to have them as part of the team. They were in the same room with us. When I joined the company, they were in the same room with all the developers, and when I came, one of the things I did in the first few months is go to their manager and ask them to be removed from the room. And the reason wasn't that they were being off in any way. The reason was that the team had somehow, probably culturally, picked up this reporting structure where when there was no manager, there was a manager, and the product owner played that role really nicely in the team. And I, as a new member in the team, I was, for example, struggling with getting information because it all flowed through the product owner who did not necessarily remember to tell the right parts to me as the team's tester so that I could do my work, work properly. So just a physical movement first had happened already. So we had just moved him to another floor. And from there, they were uh, having this, this uh, uh, kind of like still holding the very same role but the developer's laziness already had changed the system so that they would now report to each other instead of reporting to the person where they had to walk one flight of stairs to get to. So it's that little. So, so the whole remote work and all that, you know, even in the one bigger building, one floor is enough to, to change the dynamic. Uh, we were releasing frequently, and I already talked about the no estimating part. So what we did... Uh, we kind of looked at the bigger picture of what the product owner does, but then we created a very specific list of the duties that were being handed out. And out of that list, we found uh, one thing that the, the person who used to be holding a product owner role was like a really, really long list, probably like 20, 30 different items that they were doing. All of them kept coming to the team except one. There was one item around requirements trawling, fishing for requirements. So basically, when you have 
some thousands of partners and some millions of customers, having 12 developers talk to a million people, uh, it doesn't really scale. You don't get to do that. So having someone who would be kind of the receiving end of, of emails and, and responsible for responding like, thank you, we heard this uh, 1000 second time and you know we are keeping this on our list of things and considerations and, and kind of you know somehow fishing for the important information was, a, was an important part. So we made the product owner or the, the past product owner, we made them, we call them a product management expert. I tried to call them product management specialist, but PMS made, you know, as a, as a uh, 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 shortening, uh, they didn't really like it. So expert sounded a lot, lot better. And the only responsibility we assigned out of that whole list of things the product owner was doing was be available in all the boring meetings that keep on happening. Because usually that's why their weeks were so uh, full of stuff, is that, you know, different customers, different partners would come and visit us and they would always be representing us in those, those meetings. So requirements trolling was, was left with them. So three months passed and in the end we asked around the team and also outside the team on what kind of things happened. And the first thing that the team reported is, well, nothing changed, you know, removing one person product owner didn't change really anything like nothing is, is different from here but then we made a list of the past six months and the now uh, three months and we compared what we had delivered and we realized that we had delivered a lot more like a lot more we had also delivered things on higher quality as in uh, we now cared a lot about uh, uh, I call it we call it telemetry basically analytics information so developers, now that they were responsible, they refused to build features that nobody would be using. So they introduced a lot of features around knowing what we were actually using so that we can turn them off or take them out if they were not used. And having direct connections with the customers when they found a problem that was painful for someone, the empathy that they felt was almost, you can almost grasp it. And all of that, like I've not felt so much joy in development than I felt when, when that kind of like, you know, we're now free and we can do the, the decisions ourselves when that started emerging. So many kinds of things that I almost call magical happened. Like I don't know exactly how they're connected to this change, but people started taking responsibilities and participating in discussions that they had not uh, volunteered to do before and one of the most difficult things for us to do was have the product owner in the room and not say I want it this way the priority should be this way and just you know watch the priorities unfold sometimes you know pitch in some information but still say that the final decision on what gets implemented right now kind of like into this this planning uh, when you're making choices is on the development team. So that was something that we really needed to, to practice. Uh, the product owner themselves uh, reported that they had now time for, they called it strategic thinking. I'm not sure what that means because I have not yet, after a year, seen uh, a big impact of that strategic thinking. So I know that I do a lot of strategic thinking all the time and I feel very guilty when I can't connect, you know, my awesome thoughts of, of what the world could look like into anything practical because Actually, we are, you know, paid to deliver results. So again, if this is a learning experience for all of us, it is only positive. So failing, F-A-I-L, uh, fail means first attempt in learning. So doing something wrong is never a bad thing. But anyway, they said they had strategic thinking time. <clears throat> and uh, the interesting part was that during the three months, they didn't come back with all from the meet from all of the meetings because now we could measure the meetings output or well actually input to the development teams. They came up with nothing. So three months of meetings and quite many of them. You should really think about kind of like how efficient your meetings with your stakeholders are. Nothing that we didn't already know. But you need to remember we have thirty years with this product and this specialty area already behind us. Computer security 
is not always the domain where the customer knows best. Viruses, most of us haven't seen one in our lifetime. So again, it's a very uh, specific area in, in that sense. Sense. So this was something that really kind of piqued our interest on like, you know, how will that turn out to be in longer term? And now that we've been doing this for a year, uh, we have now one thing that they have brought back to us in whole year. But we also have a lot stronger relationship in having these discussions on the daily basis. On like, We don't necessarily notice what kind of things they're bringing, but their, their competence, their knowledge is, is a bigger part of, of, of just having discussions nowadays. So some aspects on this, this, uh, this uh, experiment that on day 21 was really funny being one of, you know, one of our demos where uh, the developers basically in the team uh, ran a demo and they showed a couple of new features that they had built in the last, last couple of weeks. So we had a cadence for showing things around in the company. And uh, they got really positive feedback from all around sales organization. And, and that's, uh, that it was a really good demo. Like it was one of the best demos that they had seen for a while. And, and, and the funny part was that the developers were like, oh, you know, we're supposed to be doing that. You know, like, you know, that's, that's what we do now. And, and most of the demos ever since actually have had a lot more of a customer focus. And they nowadays opt out of delivering a demo where there isn't a focus for, for that, that group. So not just showing things uh, for progress's sake, but actually showing the, the results and the, the impacts. Also, another interesting part during this experiment time was that on 65 days, so that was closer to the end of the 90 days that we were running this, we realized that, hey, we haven't actually seen the, the product uh, management specialist or the product management expert in planning for a while. Like we had these sessions where they could show up and we would be together at a certain time and they were invited and all that, but we hadn't seen them, them for a while and we hadn't really realized that we could even miss them at that point anymore because we were so active in designing and, and deciding on, on whatever the, the product backlog would look like ourselves. And uh, also we saw him kind of on the corridors, like, you know, you would walk by and, and how, how is it like now going and, you know, any interesting things going on with the customers and, and like what kind of things is going on in your floor and, you know, just chatting up and then telling that back to the team. That was more of the practice that we, we ended up with. But out of all of this kind of experimenting, there were some impacts that I really kind of wanted to highlight. The first thing that really happened is that anything and everything that was clear to the developers, that they felt that somebody had told them not to prioritize, but they felt it was wrong. All of that stuff got implemented in the three months. Like they fixed all of the bugs that we had on our backlog that had been lying around probably for years because we didn't have time. There was something more important. So they got, they got working on those and, and they fixed a lot of them. Also, uh, some of the, the, the fixing was really, like a lot of it actually was very customer oriented. So, uh, for example, there was this one fix where a customer was asking us, like, can we have this fixed? And, and then they were wondering, like, when is it actually available? Because sometimes the product is not the easiest one to understand when a particular change is available in production, so many different moving parts. So the team even kind of like, you know, went through and, and checked that the fix is available on a particular date and then communicate it back to that customer. So it was really like many ways, like gearing it up uh, so that the fixing uh, that was supposed to be happening already before really started happening. But this didn't stop people from doing other things than just fixing. So uh, well, the cross team ownership was about the, the uh, providing that uh, kind of uh, fix for other themes. Uh, we also, uh, talking more to the customers, we realized that some of the pains they had were not about the software. It was about not knowing how to use the software. So we kind of geared up also the, the customer facing documentation. So developers were the first to volunteer on, you know, writing uh, community articles and, and help documentation, things they usually would opt out on. But now that they knew that someone really, really needed them and wanted them, they would actively go and, and put that. And since all of the information was already in their head, it wasn't much of work for them, but it would have been actually much work for someone else to try to dig it out from their heads and then start delivering it. So again, a really uh, nice benefit there. Uh, many of the solutions we needed to provide, uh, there was a lot faster delivery. 
So again, with the, the empathy feeling, like knowing that this is needed and, and figuring out how to deliver it uh, in the first valuable bit first and then more, like the agile way of delivering. We really got uh, a lot better with that. That and there was one particular feature around installations that we were supposed to be implementing and we had been already six months telling that it's a big project, it's going to take us forever, like, you know, probably another six months before it's available. And after we met the, the salesperson on that area and understood their problem, it was delivered in a week, the first version of that, and later on we replaced it with a proper solution. But it, they had it available basically almost six months earlier than what we had originally planned for when we felt disconnected with the, the, the real, real problem. Also, the, the incremental delivery, like we were already delivering incrementally, but a lot of times there was a lot of process around kind of like uh, taking something from the backlog and then uh, refining it and understanding what it should be and, and having a discussion around it and making sure different participants developers, designers, UX people, testers, all of them like, you know, would have their say on it before it got built or while it got built and after it got built. And a lot of times uh, it was really difficult to, to do these minimal changes. But whatever we considered viable tended to be a lot bigger than, than it, it, uh, it turned out to be. So when the team got the responsibility and, and felt like they were in the ownership, they also figured out that they could do smaller changes and, and continuously deliver. So it was more like a flow, like, again, how do you get most water moved from one place to another is, you know, a drop at a time. If you try using buckets and carrying them around, it's probably uh, slower than having a continuous flow where, where you, you deliver it. So hiding things with feature flags, keeping them under the hood for a while, sometimes doing that, showing it only to particular customers, figuring out the right ways of doing it, uh, got a lot more active, so we, we got nice feedback on, on that one. Then also uh, we uh, learned by talking to the, uh, the real users and the real partners that they needed something that weren't, you know, it never came through. So we really identified a big broken phone effect in the way that we had worked before. So sometimes, you know, keeping us safe from all the distractions meant that they wouldn't tell us about somebody's important problem because, you know, it's only 10% of our customers or only 2% of our customers or only half percent of our customers. But again, even those, when you scale it into numbers, the numbers are in millions, that's actually quite many people who are annoyed or, or uh, somehow inconvenienced. And many of the features, uh, you really don't know what the feature is that you're supposed to be building unless you have that direct learning experience with the, the original uh, source. So the proxy uh, uh, way of working wasn't giving this all for us in the same way as it could. Also then uh, the team, like I already mentioned earlier, uh, as soon as they felt that they had the power, they decided that they don't do any decisions anymore without having analytics data. So. Uh, we didn't only introduce analytics data on the positive cases on basically like does it work, how many people are using it, but we also introduced analytics around problems. So when you have a scale of things, you want to see how many people have a particular type of problem. So that changed the way we, we implemented many of our features. And we actually even learned at some point uh, in the last six months, so after the experiment time, we learned that one of our features had never worked properly in production. When we released it with telemetry, uh, we learned that 50% of the users could use it. Nobody was complaining. So the negative telemetry was really, really important. And I'm really happy that last week we got to 95%. So we have, with the numbers visible, seeing what is actually happening over that, that scale of, of computers, we've been really able to take things forward a, a lot, lot and still. It's not that we haven't delivered any of the other stuff that people are expecting of us. So it's just, we get more through. So out of all of this, after the three months, we had the, the retro, we had those learnings, and we talked uh, around this idea that, uh, should we continue? Should we stop? What did we learn? And we decided that uh, this, experiment should turn into something that is, is permanent and we would continue in, in this mode. So now it's been a little over a year, I think a year and a half almost of, of working in this mode. 
And I took for this talk, I took the chance of, of reflecting a little bit on what were the core practices that actually, you know, over the year have taken a foothold. So first of all, I think that what, what is kind of like the cultural atmosphere that is really, really important is that even though we kick out the product owner, we don't really kick out the product owner. Like they are still as valuable a person as ever. We still talk to them. We don't isolate them. We don't try to keep them away. The only thing we're trying to say is that instead of having the power of decision on that one person, that one person gets to review whatever decisions were being made. And they, unfortunately, sometimes need to expect or uh, accept that we might make a different decision than they would have made, but they need to let us make our own mistakes and trust that we will be learning on them. So the idea of never excluding a person was very strong in the way we worked. So we really organized all of our work as in the kind of this network of connections. So every single person in the team has a network. I talk to the product owner, I talk to this team's this developer, I talk to this tester in, in our Polish office. Like I, I have my network. And whatever I fish out of that network, I bring back home to my team so that they can get the, the core of my learnings. And every one of us is expected to work the same way. In the 12-person team, sometimes people say that, you know, we can do this because we are so seniors, 25 years, you know, that gives you a lot of seniority. But I have a colleague who is now 17. He was 16 when we started doing this. He was 15 when he joined the team. And he, when he's the only one in the room who shows up, uh, when somebody shows up and asks something of the team, he takes whatever for the team, makes sure we others are aware of it, and makes sure that the answers, whatever was asked of the team, get, uh, uh, go back to, to whoever was, was needing something from us. So every single uh, not every single uh, person in this, this network, in the team that we are working with, is bringing stuff back to the team. We don't have to have all the answers, but we need to be responsible for, you know, helping the, working with the others and figuring out the, the answers. Another re thing that became really, really, really important, I can't stress this enough, is bias to action. A lot of times we would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and then talk some more and then go home and sleep and then talk some more and we can easily use two three weeks into just talking and nothing is delivered even the bad stuff isn't delivered and bad stuff delivery isn't a bad thing because you can also take it out software is malleable you can put stuff in but you can also take stuff out so believing in kind of this idea that you can make changes was a really profound one. And instead of waiting to know the right thing to build, building something and then making sure it was the right thing to build was much more important. And I think this is the core practice for being more effective or efficient in, in output, delivering uh, right kind of things in general. So we need to talk before we start, but there is a point when it goes too much and, and we overanalyze. Then with customers, we have this rule of meeting them at least, where some of them, different ones every time usually, at least once a month. Like if we notice we haven't talked to a real customer, that's a, a smell. So we, we go and, and, and meet them, so we don't want to keep a distance. And it also means that several people from the team are active in our open community forums and and some of us get personal emails from customers. I have many customers as LinkedIn friends, and they keep on complaining to me, you know, about some of the problems. And I just say thank you, and I actually do solve their problems because I care. So uh, we don't try to keep them at a, you know, a distance, but we try to make sure we, we solve the problems so that we don't have a problem of having to, you know, fend off the customers. So that's what, what we try to do. And then we've realized that uh, people don't mean to lie, but they do lie because they just can't grasp the scale. And data, it lies too. It actually is a huge scale of lying, but it lies a little less than people. And you can always ask more questions and go and, 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 and add that perspective from, from the data. So this is what we learned after a year, a little over a year 
of, of no product owner. And the feedback right now is, uh, uh, this was from my annual review as the team's manager. You have the best team in corporate R&D. And probably you did something to make this happen. I actually think the team did a lot more. More on, on that. But, you know, it's you know, anecdotal evidence. I have it in writing, so if anyone wants to ever see it, I can show it. Uh, then uh, I have as my this year's goal is to, you know, get other teams in FCQ trying something similar to take responsibility and, and learn these kind of, of design skills and, and dare to talk to the customers and do all of the fun stuff that designers and, and product owners get to do. And uh, that team, when they considered if they would now start on that, this was their feedback. Well, you're one team. It's not sufficient proof that it's this approach is better. Uh, also, our team uh, lacks the seniority that your team has. And we don't have the communication skills that your team has. So we can't attempt it. And all I could say back to them is, you know, nothing changes if you don't start changing stuff. Like, you can't complain about things being bad if you don't do something different. You have to be responsible for your own team's happiness and your own results. And again, experiments don't have to stick. This one stuck, but they don't have to. Uh, one of the things I've learned over the years, this is uh, a picture from a mob programming session, is that there's a very powerful idea called cognitive dissonance. When I first time heard that there was a way of working where you would use one computer and you would have eight people working on the single computer, I thought that was ridiculous. Uh, it was so ridiculous, I had to try it. Same way as no product owner is so ridiculous that I had to try it. And I learned that when I was doing it, uh, it completely rewrote my history. That's how the human mind works. So when your belief system and your actions are in conflict, one of them somehow changes. And a lot of times doing something that you think is wrong is the best way to help you see that it actually might be right. So out of all of this, what we got is, is that uh, developers really, really love solving problems. And when they're taught to pull information so that whatever ideas they have are the best possible to provide the best possible code for uh, solving these problems, they do a brilliant job at it. So pulling instead of pu uh, pushing the information. And that's what the no product owner experiment and, and the whole practice really gave us. That's what I had to share today. Do we have like a moment for questions or? All right. All right, a couple of minutes of questions. Yeah, uh, well, we did that same thing as well. Like, you know, again, uh, in about 15 years of Agile, we've done pretty much all of the things. I was just talking with someone on the safe counter there, like there was a safe uh, thing. So like, you know, uh, Le Dean Leffingwell was working at FCQ when he created safe, and we completely threw away every bit of that, but we did try all of it. So again, uh, trying things that you think are wrong is the best uh, way of, of, of making progress in, in Agile. So first we uh, removed uh, the person from the room and then we removed the role completely. So the person is still in the organization. They're still doing other work, you know, completely different assignments. They are just no longer acting actively with this team because they basically need only a few hours a week at most to work with us. So we have a team of four or five product owners, and they split work amongst different products in a different way. And I haven't followed up in, in detail on what is, is that work that he is particularly doing. I've seen that they're doing some uh, analysis related to customer retention. So, so usually it looks to be more of these like uh, uh, understanding how our business numbers are, are changing type of work rather than working with the development team. Yeah? So again, all the time when we have scale, 
Like there's so many end users, you can't have the real customer as the product owner. You end up having proxies. So my view is that it's better to have many proxies so everyone in the team is a proxy. And it still doesn't necessarily hurt to have some really good proxy who just specializes in that. So I'm not against having those people. I'm, um, I'm warning around the hierarchical idea that you know, now this is this person's responsibility and the impacts of that. Yeah, so again, uh, be careful, it's a language thing, be careful saying, I decide, I prioritize, I get to say, and make sure it's always the team who you empower. All right, yeah, I'm going to be around today and tomorrow, so again, like, you know, you can have as much discussions as you like with me on the free time. Thank you very much.